This is Kelly Hill, Executive Editor of RCR Wireless News. I'm here on the show floor at Mobile World Congress Los Angeles 2019 with Steve Douglas, who's head of 5G with Spirit Communications. How are you, Steve? I'm doing good, Kelly. Nice to be talking to you today. Absolutely. So you guys had some big some big news this week in terms of 5G and service assurance. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, we were uh, announcing today a, a major uh, piece of business we did here with a, a North American uh, Tier 1 service provider mm -hmm. um, who's at this stage obviously rolling out uh, 5G uh, in its first incarnation in the non-standalone mm -hmm. um, and the big real difference is rather than bringing service assurance in at a later stage as the networks start to get slightly more ruled out uh, they're engaging with service assurance at this very very early stage to help them uh, as they start turning up uh, the new sales sites and their new markets and then to continuously uh, monitor for quality and performance um, of the uh, of the networks as they roll out and the big change for them was this realization that traditional service assurance methods uh, such as using uh, uh, passive probes um, and pure just telemetry monitoring um, was not actually going to give them the visibility that they required now with this new dynamic hybrid networks that they've got. Uh, and one of the unique things Sparrant's been developing over the last number of years is a thing called Active Service Assurance, where we uh, have active software test agents deployed end-to-end -end across the networks, generating synthetic traffic uh, to be proactively identifying faults or issues um, before they impact the customer. And it's a fairly, you know, and just from reading over the release, it sounds like it's a it's a very large rollout that you guys are going to be involved with. Oh, it's it's uh, long term nationwide. Uh, today we're already in twenty plus uh, markets where it's being de deployed. It'll be over a hundred markets probably uh, in the next six months. Wow. Um, and then there's the migration also then to standalone um, as the carriers start to move to the next generation, and um, to really start taking those advantages of differentiation and going into the the new types of markets like enterprise and industrial. Okay, great. And then uh, I think the other piece of uh, news you guys have coming up is uh, an announcement related to 5G and automotive with the University of Warwick. Yes, um, when we spoke last at uh, Barcelona we were telling you about our, our new technologies called the Digital Twin. Yes. Uh, basically a, a network in a box uh, for 5G, mm -hmm. a software a replica emulation of all the parts of a 5G network from radio to core. Um, and the University of Warwick is working closely in the UK with the automotive industry to be the pioneers for uh, the future of connected autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that there, we're helping them bring 5G into their testbed environments to allow the automotive manufacturers to bring their vehicles in there um, and test them in a controlled environment with the full 5G network, including the standalone core, which, uh, which they'll be deploying. Um, now to help them test things like network slicing and new differentiated services but also disaggregation of functions out to the network edge which is going to be critical um, for the automotive industry uh, with edge sites on our highways and uh, and within our inner cities. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, what is a, setup, a test setup like um, like you're talking about for automotive you know what does that look like? Yeah it's, it's quite an innovative setup where they have a 360 degree um, environmental simulation environment and mm -hmm. um, so the car itself sits in this environment um, on like a, uh, a good way to describe it would be like on a treadmill and uh -huh. um, the car sensors and cameras believe that that environment is the real roads that it's on uh, it can see pedestrians it sees the road it sees nightfall dusk etc and then we wrap around that the digital twin which is emulating all of the radio conditions whether it be 5g satellite signals coming into it the new core network so now the car not only thinks is it in that environment, it also thinks it's in that communication environment. The beauty of it is the communication environment, because it's under our, all our control, we can manipulate it in any way we want to run all the different what-if scenarios, to understand all different types of network slicing uh, could, uh, could be valuable for the automotive uh, industry as that car is uh, traversing uh, real world conditions or what it believes are real world conditions. Uh, the desire for the automotive industry is that this will hopefully accelerate a lot of the testing and the prototyping they need to do mm -hmm. um, and limit or reduce at least some of the mileage that they physically have to do on test tracks or, or real live roads. And then they don't have to have their own 5G spectrum to do the testing either. E exactly, because one of the headaches they've had at the moment is getting access to experimental uh, licenses for spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, they might only get them for a few months at a time, um, and, but that doesn't really justify the effort that they need to put in. So having a, an environment which replicates or emulates that for them, um, long 
long term and is under their control um, is very beneficial. And what are some of the other you know, possible uh, use cases or, or industries that might be interested in something like a, a 5G emulated network in a box? Yeah, I mean, our, I suppose it really came also from the automotive side. Their manufacturing plants um, mm. started to uh, be very interested in the concept as well of the digital twin. They genuinely very interested in what 5G can do to their factories in terms of the types of efficiencies, automation that could be brought into it, uh, the potential future move away from industrial ethernet to a, a single over-the-air communication technology. The hardship for them or, or the complexity for them today is that um, their environments are brownfield unless they build a brand new greenfield site uh, to take 5G in and, and experiment with it. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult. Um, going into a brownfield environment and trying to get access again to live spectrum, to have a network around it just to work out what the benefits are mm -hmm. is simply too complex and costly. So having an emulation environment um, that they can use and, and working with the simulation of their factory environment, combining that together, gives them a really good playground to work out what the benefits of 5G could be for their uh, brownfield factories, which are, at, at the end of the day, but 99% of what they have um, and saving them the need to think about always having to build a new factory. Okay. So you mentioned some of the possible efficiencies that 5G can enable. Um, you were on a panel here this week about 5G and sort of the, the power questions surrounding this new network technology. Tell us a little bit about uh, about that and, and what you discussed in that panel. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a great, great panel um, because there is genuine concerns about uh, 5G. Uh, we know, you know, you know. There's, I don't think it's it's hard to say. We, we're all aware of that uh, the climate crisis uh, that we're under at the moment, uh, with the IPCC giving us only a 50/50 chance of getting down to the 1.5 degree target in the next 12 years. Um, and yet, uh, with the start of 5G, there is genuine concern uh, by our customers and by the the market that we're going to suddenly need 300% more base stations for the small cell sites, mm -hmm. for these massive yeah. antenna arrays consuming more power. Um, we're suddenly going to disaggregate the network, have a lot more edge servers, thousands more, and connecting billions of things that were never intended to be connected years ago, all requiring power. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about that, there is a concern, well, that's going to obviously increase our carbon emissions. And um, but what we were really talking to the industry about, well, 5G is making great strives uh, to work on that, those concerns and actually demonstrate that 5G can be more efficient than traditional LTE networks today. Um, and part of that we were showing the new technologies which are coming into the radio networks, being able to reduce power consumption by up to nine times what's currently seen today. A migration even on to, uh, away from LTE on the 5G uh, could reduce power consumption by up to 25% a real strong use case why you should move quicker maybe to 5G. Um, and even on the edge, these data centers where people are starting to be concerned about that we're going to need lots of them consuming power, moving to a full disaggregated architecture rather than a centralized one actually again has shown huge cost savings in terms of power consumption as we start to embrace virtualization and new technologies within uh, those data centers. And I think um, I think one of the other things that you talked about was not only 5G addressing ICT power related issues, but also 5G potentially helping other industries reduce their power consumption as well. I, I think this is really the probably the holy grail for it. I mean, our industry, the ICT industry's power consumption is between sort of 1.5 and 2 percent of global consumption. And yes, of course, it's in our interest to obviously get our own house in order um, and reduce that as, as much as we can. But that's not really going to change the global impact that we see. But enabling it into other industries, uh, such as, again, smart manufacturing and our factories. Mm -hmm. um, a major study was done in Europe where um, if we could evolve our, to smart factories using 5G and get those efficiencies there, we could reduce uh, carbon emissions by uh, 0.5 gigatons. Um, now, to put that in perspective, that's uh, like planting trees across 20% of all of Australia uh, to suck carbon uh, and maintain carbon. So that's a pretty pretty good uh, return of investment. But it's not just in our factories, it's also in our, our cities, um, as we have smart buildings, smart transportation systems, and in the automotive industry itself, um, where we're seeing the potentially huge uh, reductions in CO2 emissions, if we can marry together connectivity and autonomy and really enable that future of the autonomous vehicle. And we're helping, again, the industry in this space around our digital twin technologies, helping to 
uh, start to explore how you could model the relationship between power efficiency and still providing the performance, the quality of experience and service on the networks. Yeah. So the networks understand those trade-offs um, and it can really make themselves more efficient. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I hope it's been a good week at the show. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye. Yeah, okay.